Welcome to today's edition of Gibson's Caring Corner. Today we're going to be talking about composing your life song. Creighton, what does that mean? So what we're really going to be talking about is is for your parents and how to understand getting started on their final year's plan. Uh, learn where to find assistance, and then recognize the importance of the conversations. Communication, conversations, always big, especially whenever you're wanting to do what your parents want you to do um, for their wishes and their planning, So, and how to celebrate, as some people would say, their life. Mm-hmm. So, Creighton, what have you learned that can help us with that? Well, some of the research that I pulled off of of our corporate office, um, I found that seniors are more comfortable planning, 79% of them are more comfortable planning funerals, 74% are more comfortable planning when full-time care is needed, and then 71% hospice or palliative care. Okay, and I know um, you and I both, we both have have already lost our fathers, Mm -hmm. and you have already lost your mother. Uh, So with that being said, how did you feel about um, the plans that were already in place for you? Well, with mom and dad, very... They were very simple. Um, They let me know that they wanted to be cremated, that they were good with a memorial. They didn't want to be shown, um, that it was just simple for them, pretty straightforward. Um, I knew knew what what their wishes were. And if I'm remembering right, I'm wanting to think your mother even had her obituary written. She did. Yeah, so that was how detailed she was, and what a blessing Mm -hmm. um, to have all of that in place. Now, with your father, you know, he had he had a massive stroke. You know, and opposites do attract. So I do know that we knew his wishes, but all those little details, you know, we had to put those together, didn't we? Yeah, with Dad, I mean, he he had talked to me the last four or five years that. You know, he wanted to be cremated, too, that that was uh, his wishes. It was simple. It, it It's what he wanted. Um, his comment to me over the years was, don't don't show me and, and then drag me down to the funeral home and then drag me over to the cemetery. He said, I, I'm old. I don't want to travel that much. <laughs> um, he just, he, he was good with uh, a memorial. And, and we did it simple, and that's what he wanted. And I would say that, you know, that was a blessing knowing that. Mm, sure. And, and like with my father, um, it was very unexpected. You know, he went to an urgent care, then the hospital. We thought that he was going to have some time, you know, maybe up to six months in hospice. Yeah. But from and within one week period, you know, God had a different plan, and he, he was gone. Right. Um, so... Um, there were things that were planned, but there was never any communication about them. That's right. So, you know, the wills were in place, the what, what he wanted was in place, but the children, three of us, had no idea right. about He'd any of it. He had never shared. Yeah, he had never shared because right. he was a very private man. Um, so that made it a little bit difficult for us, but you know, it all came together and all of us did communicate well. We did respect one another. Right. And whenever there's multiple children, that is so important mm-hmm. of respecting one another, especially when it comes to their what you believe their last wishes are if you aren't if you do not have a piece of paper to go by. That's right. Is the best best way to say God that. Right. And I will say on May eighth we will have um um, maybe one or two people from Cross White and Cross White that will come and speak to you about um, how to do some of that estate planning and what to look for mm-hmm. and share some of those good good nuggets of information with you. Yeah. So what other research that we found, we found that seniors who have started making plans for their final years usually begin doing so around age 70. Eighty-five percent of the seniors agree planning for their final years is a chance to decide 
how their life story ends. So, yeah, how do you get started? Well, yeah, you need to consider personality and preferences with your loved ones. So, yeah, if if their personality is very simple and very conservative, like Creighton's dad was, it's going to look different than someone that was a red dot, colorful, just, you know, um, what do you call it? Not an extrovert, if they were an extrovert. So their their final arrangements would, would be different than someone that might be an introvert. So, um, and what, what would that, you know, what would those personality preferences look like? Look at the big picture. What's, what's the goal? Is it a celebration of life? I would hope so. Most people, that is what um, their services are. And looking at that big picture and planning for it. Mm-hmm. Identifying who can help with that plan. Sometimes it's people within their church. Sometimes it's family members. I mean, you may have someone that is just that has to get you know go out and give speeches in your family, and they might be s- someone that would help lead um, that event. Um, and then decide how to handle the finances. You know, have things been prepaid? Is there long-term care insurance? Yeah, you know, with my father again, I got you know uh, an insurance plan, an annuity that I had Never no clue had. existed. Yep. Just until last week, and he passed away last November. So that yep. was, yeah, you know, that was about I don't know eight months ago now. So, yeah, you know, it would be really good if you would communicate everything to your children and not just surprise them. Um, and then think about a bucket list. So if you have, you know, still have mom or dad, and there's things on their bucket list that they have not done yet, you know, just don't let there be a hole just developing that, and then all the, their bucket list items just get fall through, you know, they fall through. Mm -hmm. See what that is. See if you can help accomplish that. Um, That would be an awesome thing. Um, And I know I've shared with you bucket list things from a different episode. So anyway, try that. So Creighton, where can they find assistance? Well, of course, you can always consult your attorney. Um, Tracy and I, as we were looking at what to do when dad had a stroke, um, you know, we we consulted him, and he said, "Well, you need a durable power of attorney and a durable health care power of attorney, and and you need to know what his living will is, what his wishes are." And and we did all that, and thank God we did. It was eight years before we needed it, but thank God we used that. Um, finances, get you a financial planner and consult with them. Um, of course, the Funeral director, when you get to that point, can help guide you if you need it. And then, of course, just research resources that's in the community. And then you want to just tie up loose ends. So I remember um, you know, whenever going to the funeral home, and they didn't have this whenever no, your, your mom and dad passed didn't. away. But um, you, know, you can even get jewelry. If someone's cremated, you can get their ashes, put in jewelry and earrings. I, I was just amazed. I couldn't believe all the choices you had now of, of what you wanted to do with their with the different arrangements and and there's you know, all different choices in, in the in the caskets and yeah. You know, it, it was almost like you needed a day of shopping to figure out, you know, what what you would want your loved one to have. Mm-hmm. And um, so just know that if you're able to plan that ahead of time, that would just be an emotional relief um, for your loved one. So just, mm-hmm. just know that. All right. So have you or your senior loved one started planning yet? Have you? I probably need to talk to mom again. Um, I know I have a, a drawer in the file cabinet. I know there's some information in there. Do I remember what all's in there? No. Uh-huh. So I would say probably revisit that information every couple of years, if not annually. Maybe whenever you change your batteries and your and your smoke alarms. Um, yeah, yeah, that might be a good time just to relook at that because things change. People change addresses. People move. Um, and who knows, maybe even your preference of your funeral home may change. So, yeah. there, and who's going to be singing and who your pastor? Make sure things are still the way you would want them, I would say. Now, who is your go to person to have all the conversations with? So, for the, the senior, I would think who was going to be your executor of your will 
would be who you would want to go to because you feel that they would be one that would be in charge. They would have the personality to be able to carry out your wishes or they would not be your executor or executrix. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I would have those conversations with them. And then who in your life, it may be a different child, um, who in your life would it be important for them to communicate your plan? So when something happens to you, who would you want to share all that information with your family, with your friends, um, and to, let's say, just get the ball rolling, rolling on what your final wishes would be? Mm-hmm. So, Creighton, what are those five important conversations? So one of them, make sure everyone understands what you want. Second one, find out what medical options are available. And, of course, discuss your financial goals. Engage in a spiritual advisor. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have. That was our corporate <laughs> one. Uh, so, so that was just kind of funny. We'll just have to stop there for a minute. So here in the South, in the Carolinas, we're going to say you would you would have that conversation with your pastor, with yes. your preacher, yeah, yeah, with yes. with the person in charge at the church is who you would have that conversation with. Yeah. And then, of course, the fifth one is convey your wishes to your care team. And your your care team should include your children, mm-hmm. but I would say that would also include your primary care physician. Yeah, you, know, you could just say, yeah, I want this in in my files here. Yeah, you, know, you can go to the Secretary of State and download. All the documents that the hospitals always ask you for, yeah. facilities, yeah, you can download those things. The federal law just says that they have to ask you if you have those things in place. Right. They don't give them to you. So it's important for you to make sure they're taken care of, whether it's through an attorney um, or another professional, like, like um someone that can help you. So anyway, I'm going to say the Secretary of State gives you great guidelines Mm -hmm. on where to get started with that. And again, we're in North Carolina. If you're watching this podcast and you're in a different state, your state may be different. But in our state, you can download those things. And if you live in a metropolitan city, it even says that you can file all those documents on a little emergency card that you can carry with you. So, um, and they can scan that. Unfortunately, in our small community, our hospitals and EMS, they do not have that ability yet. But I do hope in the future that they will, because it would be a great way of communication if that card was in place and they could scan it and know everyone's wishes, no matter what. Yep. Okay. All right. Anything else, Creighton? Not today on this. All right. Well, I hope today that you have learned something from planning for yourself or for your loved one. Yeah. I know Creighton and I, you know, we're you know we're in our fifties, sixties, and um, we we had more conversations about about this this past week. So um, I do feel it's important um, for you to have those conversations because you never know when God's going to say it's time to go home. Right. And having those things in place is so important. And um, at the at the least, with your spouse, you know, having those conversations, and then for your children, more formal and in a a well documented arrangement. Right. Have a great day, and thank you for joining us on Gibson's Caring Corner. Hi, welcome back to Health Tips with Kale, your exercise science, health, and fitness enthusiast. So today we're going to change things up a little bit and talk about stress. So most of us. Mind no stress when we get stressed out. Uh, A lot of times we say, oh, that really stresses me out, or they really stress me out. Or we might think of, oh, that's really gonna get me fired up. You know, so there's a bunch of sayings we have for when we do get stressed out or when we know that we're going to get stressed out. But what exactly is stress? Well, according to the American uh, Psychology Association, Stress is defined as a state of mental, emotional, and physical tension caused by outside factors. The National Institute of Mental Health says it's a body's response to a demand or challenge that exceeds one's abilities to cope resulting in a change. So I want to kind of look at it this way. Think of a circle on a page. 
If you want to, go and draw out that circle on the page and then put a dot in the middle of that circle. So that circle is your comfort zone. That's where we find ourselves to be the most comfortable. What makes you the most comfortable? When are you at your most relaxed state? Are you that individual that enjoys watching TV, sitting on the couch, never having to interact with others? Or do you really enjoy being in a buzzing cafe, surrounded by millions or hundreds of people, and working on your new, newest project? So, as you know, every one of us, there's something, there's something that we all find comforting and all things we don't find comforting. And it's different for each one of us. So if you think about it this way, stress is anything that pushes or pulls us outside the boundary of that circle. So for the person that really enjoys just sitting and watching TV on the couch all day, for them going to that cafe might be stressful for them. For them, they might find it stressful to go to a grocery store or to have to go to work to talk to others. For the person that really enjoys being in the cafe, they might find it stressful being alone. They might find sitting in a cubicle, being isolated is stressful for them. Or nowadays, sitting at home by themselves. So stress isn't just a black or white sort of substance. Stress can be acute or short term. It can also be chronic or known as long term. So acute stress is a short term or a specific to a specific situation or event such as a job interview or almost getting in a car wreck. There is also episodic acute stress, which is frequent bouts of acute stress due to a chaotic or disorganized lifestyle. And then you've got chronic stress which is a long-term stress response to things such as poverty, chronic illness, or discrimination. So if you think about it that way, acute stress would be, as I said, the job interview, or it might be me sitting down for this podcast. The episodic acute stress that is saying not being able to find your files or paperwork for that meeting that you needed. And maybe that's not the only time you can't find that paperwork. Maybe there's been multiple meetings that you've had to attend and you've struggled to find paperwork or you've forgotten paperwork. And it's just because you can't keep organized. Or maybe it's because you're always running late to work and you're stressed out about being late to work. But then you don't really do anything to change the fact that you're leaving five, 10 minutes late than, later than you need to. Chronic stress is, well, more severe. It can be the death of a loved one. It could be being diagnosed with a new disease. It could be being in a work environment where you're feeling attacked or discriminated. But stress isn't always a negative thing. There is such thing as positive stress. Stress is can be identified as either positive or negative depending on the nature and our individualized responses. So positive stress, or otherwise known as eustress, is a moderate stress level that is perceived challenging but manageable. And so with that, we can find it to be motivating, it could give us more energy, it could give us a sense of accomplishment, maybe even help with our improved cognitive function. It will also help enhance our physical performance it can also help cope with more difficult situations. So for me, maybe finding a new job or getting into a new job, maybe for a lot of us is very stressful. A lot of us might see it as negative, but then there's others might see it positive. So for me, it's a positive stress because I look at it as an opportunity to grow. And so that's a motivating factor for me. Negative stress, which we're all more likely used to, or no, is also known as de-stress, or distress. And that's an overwhelming level of stress that is perceived as harmful, threatening, or unmanageable. And that can lead to things as cardiovascular disease, a weakened immune system, 
mental health issues, digestive issues, sleep or disturbances, reproductive system disruptions, worsening skin conditions, and weight loss or weight, gu- weight gain. Some of us like to eat when we get stressed out and others don't want to eat at all when they get stressed out. So that's really another individualized approach. So stress isn't always just a negative thing. Sometimes we use stress to push ourselves to do a little bit better. Sometimes stress just happens to show up on our door and we have to, we have to defend ourselves last minute. Sometimes positive stress could be looked at as pushing our pace during a run just a little bit faster than what we're used to or adding more weight when we are training with weights. Positive stress could also be maybe deciding to change your eating habits or your exercise routine in general. That's also very stressful to have to make that sort of change when you're not used to it. Negative stress is that of a death of a loved one. That would be more of a chronic negative stress. It could also be being diagnosed with diabetes type 2 or diabetes type 1. Those are all, those can also be very negative stressors. Diabetes type 2 could also be a positive stressor. Because maybe then you realize like, oh, I have to really step it up and eat healthier and live a healthier, more quality life. And so that could be a positive thing. So before I let you guys go today, for this week, I want you guys to really sit back Maybe make that circle and put everything that you find comfortable for you inside that circle. What is your comfort zone? And then I want you to draw maybe another circle, maybe about an inch or so just outside and maybe make it more of a dashed circle and then kind of write, what are some stressors that I could use to help motivate me to do better? And then maybe write out those lists of what we call, or what we would consider a positive stress for you. What would be something that would be manageable for you to deal with? And then also maybe figuring out what exactly is a, too much stress for you. What is too much for you? That's all gonna be great and beneficial for our understanding of ourselves and our mental, emotional, and physical health and life. It doesn't matter if you're 70, 75, or five years old, we can all learn from this. But I'll see you guys again next week. And thank you again for joining Health Tips with Kel. Welcome back. It is time to go back in time with Elizabeth and Reinhardt Gibson. And we are, this story is in Mooresville, North Carolina. All right, so here's, here we go. Anne says, another little problem made me an antisocial. I would eat fresh garlic straight from the garden. No kidding. Had anything to do with me? No one had anything to do with me at school at all. No matter how much I brushed my teeth, rinsed my my mouth with mouthwash, (coughs) the smell never sweetened. I was mean as a rattler at lunch and at break at South Elementary School in Mooresville on Church Street. I would be playing on the playground, and the boys would pull my pigtails and tease me. I would double my fist and fight like a wild gal. Ed Carricker and Don Moore were the largest boys in our school, and they would fight back. As long as I was getting the best of them, Miss Mary Greeny and my teachers would leave us to fight. As soon as one would get a good punch in, they made us stop fighting. This went on absolutely every single day. Then there was the time at the same school when I was sitting in class and I looked around and nearly died, literally. I had my cow manure barn shoes on. Can you just imagine how awful that was for a kid? We always had barn shoes we used and coats we kept hanging in the kitchen on nails hammered on the door. As our shoes became worn, our dad used a shoe last and made repairs to make them last as long as possible. For some reason, the other girls, Alice, Ruth, Sarah, and Jeanette, never had to wear boys' brogues with hooks and eyes. Even steel toes are the kind I always had to wear. Dreams of pretty little black patent were never filled, 
Even brown and white saddle Oxfords were never mine until I was old enough to buy my own shoes. When very small and my first year of school, I recall sitting on my dad's lap, holding on for dear life, afraid I would fall onto the floor. I remember the old churn and churning butter every other day. Mother skimmed all the cream from the top of the milk and saved it, let it curdle a bit and churned, churned it for fresh butter and buttermilk. Sometimes we would be hungry in mid-afternoon and would sprinkle a bit of salt on top of the cream jar and dip a piece of biscuit in it and lap it up like candy. Dad taught us to do it for he did it. He always angered mother for us to dip into the cream. Cottage cheese was a dish my mother made from scratch. We used curdled milk placed in a little sack and let it hang on a nail to let drip dry. She salted it added cream, and served it up. Home canning surely kept our mom busy. To this day, my favorite household chore is home canning because of her teaching me the importance of preserving all that we had. Quilting the quilts we needed was done in wintertime when frames were hung in the fire room where they were wound up to the ceiling until mid-afternoon after dinner and the men folk were in the granary shucking corn or in the blacksmith shop pouring fishing sinkers or fixing plows or other farm equipment. Quilting was how we met a need for comfort in the winter. As the shop would be warm, we sometimes went out and cracked black walnuts and hickory nuts to cook with or to eat. The day Dad and I were picking cotton beside the hog pen beside of the old house, I looked up and said, Dad, the hog is out. Well, he chased that huge hog forever. Then Dad picked up a stick and handed it to me, and he got a stick also. And when the hog came by me, he said, kill the damn thing. I tapped him on the head, hoping he would go toward the pig pen, but instead, that dumb hog fell over dead as a doornail. The other big hog came by, and I tapped him on the head, and good grief, he fell over dead also. I knew my dad was going to kill me, but no, he didn't say a word. Pulled the hogs down behind the barn, buried them, never to mention it again. What a loss. And that's the end of today's stories with Anne Elizabeth Reinhardt Gibson. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching Karen Corner. Make sure you head over to our Facebook and YouTube channel where you will find this program along with others. Be sure that you subscribe, like, and click the notification bell so that you will receive notifications for our weekly program. Don't forget to share this program to your social media platforms. If there's a question that you would like to ask, make sure to email it to caringcorner22 at gmail.com. We hope to see you on the next episode of Caring Corner.